Now, middle of page 161. Because of consideration for others on the part of the Buddhas and patriarchs, we are enabled to see the Buddha even now and hear his teachings. Had the Buddhas and patriarchs not truly transmitted the truth, it could never have been heard at this particular time. Even only so much as a short phrase or section of the teaching should be deeply appreciated. Now, because of considerations, we can see the Buddhas and patriarchs. Because of the Buddhas and patriarchs, we can see the Buddha even now and hear his teachings. Of course, the historical Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, is no longer physically here. But if you find that place, which is the place of the unborn and the undying, if you find that place, in that place live all the Buddhas and everyone and everything that has truly wanted to return to the cosmic Buddha. In that place live the Buddhas and the patriarchs. And therefore, within you, when you reach that place, lives the Buddha. So you yourself are the Buddha when you reach that place, especially if you do that which the Buddha does. That is what is being spoken of here. To find that place is to find Buddhahood. To do what the Buddhas did and do is to become Buddha, to become the real, true child of Buddha. To find that place, it is necessary to meditate. For when you get beyond the opposites, then you are indeed within that place, which is the place of the Tathagata, which is another word for Buddha. Within this place dwell the Buddhas place beyond the opposite, the space within the triangle. And it is not that you are just one Buddha. You yourself, when you reach that place, are all the Buddhas. You yourself are the whole universe. By forsaking self, the universe grows I. You are the whole of it. You are not a part. You are not Buddha. The ego, the egocentric you is not Buddha. And there is nothing within you that is not Buddha. I am not God, and there is nothing within me that is not of God. The meaning of that statement. What it entails to behave absolutely and constantly keeping perceptual truth. Without the keeping of perceptual truth, there is no sign of Buddhahood. When these precepts are accepted absolutely, as it says in the previous chapter, Buddhahood is reached. The chapter on the precepts. Therefore, in Rinzai, the highest form of koan is the true meaning of the precepts. When that true meaning is accomplished, then Buddhahood is reached. You become the real child of Buddha. Soto Zen does not say you need to go through all this lot of koans first says you've already got a load of problems kicking around in your skull. Why do we have to add to them? It's the same as a phrenologist who says, well, I can't find a bump on your head, so I'll raise one and then I can read it. That is the effect that Rinzai frequently has. If you do not need a bump, you do not need a hammer. You've already got enough problems. You do not need to worry about it. Go straight to the precepts and learn their true meaning by genuinely trying to keep them. In one sense, therefore, Soto is much faster than Rinzai 
because it goes directly to the source. Rinzai says that the average person just cannot do it this way. It is too hard to do it this way. I do not know of any other way you can do it than to go directly to the source. But that is me. I am sure there are some people that cannot do it that way. So, what it entails is the keeping of perceptual truth. Sometimes I raise the eyebrows of old Chakyamuni Buddha and sometimes I do not. Sometimes I keep the precepts absolutely and sometimes I don't. Therefore, sometimes I am Buddha and sometimes I am not. It is up to me how hard I train, whether I am Buddha or whether I am not Buddha. But it is not just a simple keeping of not killing ants or being vegetarian and this sort of thing. It is going much, much further. It is finding out what it really means. Finding out that if you steal the per that which is stolen from is you. And then eventually finding out that there is nothing to steal anyway. Since there is nothing from the first, I can never own anything. I never have owned anything because the true me lives beyond this place. Therefore, how can there be anything to steal? How can there be anything to possess? How can there be any possession? Going right on to the fundamental. Now, if you take a look at page 199, you'll find, um, you know, make it, 100, uh, make it 200. They're talking there of the beginning of the transmission. The so-called I, this is the middle of paragraph 3 on page 200. The so-called I is not Shakyamuni Buddha. He is born out of this I. In other words, true Buddhahood is that which lies beyond you and I, beyond the ego of this psychophysical being that we see. The true Buddha lies beyond that, beyond the opposites. Not only he, but also the whole world and animate things are outside of it, in their true nature. When Shakyamuni was, is, and will be enlightened, they are now referring to the eternity of the true Buddhahood which lies within this place of the cosmic Buddha. When Shakyamuni was, is, and will be enlightened, the whole world and animate things were, are, and will be enlightened at the same time. Because if you see them in that place, in their right perspective, in their true essence, then the wooden figure sings and the stone maiden dances. For instead of seeing a wooden figure and a stone maiden, you are seeing the products of the cosmic Buddha you are seeing the essence of life that exists in all things. That is the I into which Shakyamuni Buddha was born. It is not the old Gotama. That was his human name before he found Buddhahood. And this also is the reason why people at the time of doing Jukai, which is the Buddhist equivalent of uh, confirmation, frequently change their names in Buddhism because they wish to be reborn as a completely new being within that place. Not only the whole world and animate things were, are, and will be enlightened, but all Buddhas in the triple universe apprehend the truth. Therefore, when you find this place, which is beyond the opposites, you not only find Buddhahood for yourself, but you become the ancestor of every Buddha that has ever been. 
because this place, this thing, is beyond time. It is unborn, undying, uncreated. Therefore, you are from the far past, from eternity to eternity, to eternity. And this was the place the Shakyamuni Buddha found. Although this is so, Shakyamuni Buddha is not conscious of being enlightened. That was something that is very important to know. You will never know when you are enlightened. You will always know when you are not. After you find this place, you will always know when you are not. When you are, you are carrying on doing that which has to be done and thoroughly enjoying it. But the instant you think, am I enlightened or not, you do not know. But you will always know when you are not enlightened. Do not look for the Lord outside the whole work, the whole world, the ground and animate things. Everything in the universe is within the Lord's eyes. You too are standing within them. Not only are you within them, they are all of you. Further, the Lord's eyes become a globule of your flesh, and all is within all, standing straight, unruled by anything. A million Buddhas stand in one straight line. Within this place, within this exquisite place, dwells all beings who have made it to Buddhahood. This is why it is necessary to cleanse the past lives of karma, so that they may stand in that line also. You have collected up these things. It is your duty to cleanse the karma so that all may return to live in this exquisite place for eternity. Who would not want to do such a wondrous thing? Who would not want to do this? I cannot understand anyone who would not want to. Therefore do not think that the Lord's eyes are the Lord's eyes, and that you are you, constantly and unchangeable. You were, are, and will be the Lord's eyes. The Lord is all of you. Very simple. Once you find this place, the universe becomes the whole of you. You are the whole universe. And you know how minuscule and unimportant you are. The awesomeness of this state cannot be described. It can only be experienced. Back to the Shushogi again. <clears throat> what alternative have we but to be utterly grateful for the great compassion exhibited in the highest of all teachings which is the very eye and treasury of the truth. The word Shorborgenzo, which is the correct name for the whole of the works of Dogen, means the eye and treasury of the truth. Now what that, that is actually, the Japanese love puns. Uh, but this happens to be a pun with a very, it's not a pun really, but it, it is one in a way, with an incredibly deep meaning. The I has always been regarded as the light of the soul. It is through the eyes that one gathers what is frequently called the light. It is in the eyes that one sees the horror or the incredible peace of a person who has truly meditated. The treasury is this triangular place down here. The eye and treasury. The pun is it is through the eyes and in 
within here that is the treasury of the truth. And therefore, the iron treasury of the truth, i.e. how to meditate, and how to see the signs of meditation. Every piece of this is within the treasury, every piece of this information you can find within yourself if you meditate properly. And the way in which everyone will know if you have meditated properly is through the eyes. And when you read this, the truth goes through your eyes and you discover that you've already got it in the treasury. It's a very, very nice circular pun. The Shaw Borgenza, the iron treasury of the true law. In other words, they're the means and the proof. You could interpret Shaw Borgenza as means and proof, if you wish. Uh, you need no further teachings than the above in order to show gratitude, and you must show it truly in the only real way in your daily life. Our daily life should be spent constantly in selfless activity with no waste of time whatsoever. Mara, which is the Buddhist equivalent of the devil, should not be understood as uh, almost a challenge to the cosmic Buddha. In Western terminology, I intend to give a long lecture on this, but I'm only going to be able to give a, some passing information on it, especially if you go through the Bible, and the Old Testament, you'll discover very steadily that the devil starts off as an adversary, and by the time he gets to the New Testament, he ends up as almost there's a God the Father and a God the Devil, and we're caught between the two. Now, that is placing us, placing ourselves in a complete... Uh, completely dualistic state which we do not need and Buddhism takes it back very much to the situation that it is in in the Old Testament where Mara is as the adversary is that which is constantly getting in the way that which wastes our time we think about, well, I'll get up and meditate in the morning and then, oh, but it's cold today. Amara has already won, you see. The cold has got in our way, or this has got in our way, or somebody can't be doing this, or somebody can't be doing that. It is that which gets in the way. And this is why I'm always saying to people, yes, there are a million times in the day you can meditate when you're sitting at a red light, Instead of thinking that the red light is in the way of getting you to where you want to go, you can say no to the adversary and just sit there and meditate and enjoy the red light, which automatically puts paid to the adversary in two different directions. You can make use of a million of these little things which will enable you to stop Mara from getting at you. I was talking earlier before most of the class got here about what happened on the radio yesterday and as I was thinking, as I saw what happened during that program, it was Mara doing his very best to waste time. And there was a couple of minutes when I very nearly said it and decided that they wouldn't know what I was talking about anyway and shut up. But that is the perfect example of what Mara does. He gets hold of something completely and utterly inconsequential and makes all the capital out of it he possibly can. In other words, that which causes us to slow down and not to study. Quietism is the last and most dangerous of Mara's occupations because it slows us down tremendously and gives us a feeling of well-being at the same time. So he's managed it both ways. 
He's made us complacent and incompetent simultaneously. Uh, A very fine Christian... uh, What do I call somebody who uh, wrestles with demons? I never could think of the word. Exorcist. Exorcist, thank you. Uh, A very fine exorcist was once asked what he thought was the rightful occupation of the devil. And his answer was to cause people to despair because they couldn't get on. Which is taking it one step further than what I've just said. There is nothing quite like despair for stopping people doing anything. I can't do anything. I'm no good. I never will be any good. What's the use of trying? You see, Mara is perfect in this role. By the way, I have got written down, I dug it up and wrote it all out, all the places in the Old Testament and the new way you can check all of these things that I'm talking about of how God the uh, devil came into being from merely being a an adversary if you like I will bring the papers next week and you can read out the sections because it's very fascinating to see how throughout the Old Testament it changes and people sort of add bits to him and add bits to him until from being a very useful sign of how not to behave, he becomes almost something with which one has to contend. And you might find that very useful for the paper for next, uh, for the end of the term. So, the purpose of Mara is to stop us becoming competent, to stop us finding what is our rightful inheritance. But he is also the assistant of the cosmic Buddha because if he works hard enough it will cause us to get so fed up with ourselves that we really do something about it Uh, so in that sense he labors mightily at his uh, God appointed task if you like to put it that way so as to make sure that those that do get through are worthy And that is how I view him. I do not view him as a negative force. I view him as something with which I must deal because he is showing me what are the potentials within me. Not as something that is dangerous, but as something that shows me where I can go wrong, where I can be caught, places where I need to work on me. A very valuable being but one who I'm not letting in. That is how one needs to think of Mara. And above all, that is how one needs to think of him in the sense, once one has had some sort of a cantrip. Because if you start thinking of him as an external thing or an external being that stops you getting to Buddhahood, you have immediately proposed these two again, the God, the Father, and the god the devil, Shakyamuni Buddha, or the cosmic Buddha, and Mara. And what have you got? You've been caught in another pair of opposites. So what you then have to do is to find a way of how you can be grateful for Mara, so that you may then turn him into an aspect of the cosmic Buddha. And if you can see Mara as the aspect of the cosmic Buddha that is showing you where you are likely to slip up, and is really working with you to help you yourself do something about your own weaknesses, then you and Mara can start doing a quite exquisite dance and win. But so long as you think of him as a devil, you cannot understand this exquisite place in which you can find gratitude even for Mara, whilst not going along with it, because the instant you like the gratitude, Mara will still come in and say, yes, aren't I a good sort? (laughs) And you're caught again. You cannot let this happen. You're constantly having to work to prevent it from taking place. 
but still appreciating what he is doing. Now, so the importance of gratitude is not wasting time at any time. You see, your longing for Buddhahood is in direct ratio to the amount of time you waste. If you truly want Buddha, if you truly want Buddhahood, if you truly want to be in this place, you are going to work as if your hair is on fire. This was Dogen's own statement. You are going to work and work and work. And instead of sitting around cursing Mara, you're going to sit back and look at him and say, wow, you're terrific. You're really giving me a lot of help. I can remember when I was coming up for one of my cantrums, being very worried about what, of, uh, what was going on around me, and about what was happening. And then one day I sat back and said, go ahead. It's terrific. I'm glad Mara's doing all this. Now I can see what needs to be dealt with and where I'm going. And the instant that happened, the thing changed. And instead of working against it, I was working with it. And we were all working together. And this is a very important point if you would truly understand. Nothing can be cut off. No life can be cut off. The life of Buddha is increasing. Constantly increase the life of Buddha. I can remember trying to broach this subject once up in Shasta and getting almost shouted down by some of the monks who were horrified because what I pointed out it was just after the time of Watergate and I pointed out how valuable uh, ex-President Nixon was for he was showing me what not to do. Therefore, he was the Buddha of the day. Anything that teaches is the Buddha of the day. And they were saying, no, 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 he's a felon, he's this, he's that. Stop putting labels on people. See their Buddha natures. Do not worry about the externals. Look right in and see the Buddha nature. See where it can be of value to you in your own personal training. You do not have to worry about the external signs of these things. Just look at it and look at it from a positive point of view. It can be very valuable. He showed me certainly what not to do. But you do not have to copy him simply because he's doing it that way. Time flies quicker than an arrow, and life passes with greater transience than due. However skillful you may be, how can you ever recall a single day of the past? Should you live for a hundred years just wasting your time, every day a month will be filled with sorrow. You will always know when you are not in life. Would you drift as the slave of your senses for a hundred years, and yet truly and yet live truly for only so much as a single day. You will, in that one day, not only live a hundred years of life, but also save a hundred years of your future life, because the next hundred years will be so full of joy, because you now know it's possible, that life will suddenly become alive. I'm sure that all of us in this room have experienced that exquisite thing you know, you go around, you've been maybe gone to school or done this or done that, and then one day something happens and you have three months or a year or something when life is suddenly so alive it's incredible. You sort of think about this for the rest of your days. Oh, my God, wasn't that gorgeous? Wasn't that wonderful? That was the time I really became alive. alive. Life is lousy now, but wasn't it wonderful then? Any of you remember things like that? I'm sure I wasn't the only one that had them. But you see, if you live in that one moment or in those few days or months, 
then you will never live again. And this is the thing that you have to watch out for. Much more about that later. I have to build a bit more of this canvas before I can go on with that one. The life of this day, this one day today, is absolutely vital life. Your body is deeply significant. Now, unlike many religions, Buddhism insists that without the ages of this physical body, you can get absolutely nowhere. Without this body, you cannot find the cosmic Buddha. If you cannot find through the experience of the senses, how will you ever find the truth no matter how far distant you may walk, says the scriptures. If you cannot look with your eyes and see what the cosmic Buddha is doing in that bush, for example, or feel this table and be grateful for how useful it is and feel the sacrifice of the trees that made it, but look at its exquisite form and be grateful for its use, if you cannot be thankful for the chair in which you sit, the warm carpet in which your feet are embedded, if you all these are things of senses. I have spoken of feel, sight, food. If you cannot be grateful for the exquisite taste of food, if you cannot feel all these things through the experience of the senses, you will never find the cosmic Buddha, because you will never know what gratitude is. All of these things are giving themselves to you. They are helping you, even if you have absolutely nothing. The ground still supports you, and it will still give you a place to sleep at night. And the sun will still warm you, and the rain will still give you water. You still have everything. If you look with the right eyes, it depends how much you want, how big your greed is. Because the more greed you have, the more you drive out gratitude. In many ways, these things are like substances. And you find this out more and more as you work on doing mudras on yourself. The more tensions you put into your body, the more you drive out or solidify the water of the spirit or turn it into gunge. The more you take those tensions out, the more the water of the spirit flows and the body feels alive and light and joyous, no matter what shape or age it may be in. The more you look with gratitude at other things, the more beautiful they become, the more tasty becomes the food, the more useful becomes everything around you. As you get rid of self, so you are filled with something else. And as you fill yourself with self, so you drive out the cosmic Buddha. And if you drive out most of the cosmic Buddha, then what happens? You merely die and all that lot of karma has got to come back and some other poor wretch has got to deal with it. So it is up to you to either find your true inheritance or to turn away from it or to become an undutiful being. You can do it one way or the other. But yes, if you do this correctly, not only does your life become 100% more fascinating and more, more joyful, your whole physical well-being changes, your whole heart and mind changes, you are no longer sick, or very, very seldom sick. There are so many stray bonuses, it's quite unbelievable, but the one thing we're really doing it for, remember, is not to get the bonuses, it is in order to be able to return to the Cosmic Buddha. 
It is because you want to be with him, because you are trying to be like him by doing that which he does, which is the complete and absolute keeping of perceptual truth. Because, in other words, you are aspiring to be absolute love. You are aspiring to be as he is. Because of this, all these actual bonuses turn up, but you can't do it in order to get the bonuses so that you can live a selfish life. That just does not work. You can only do it because everything in you wants to copy and be one with the cosmic Buddha. That is how it works and that is how it is done. Both your life and your body deserve love and respect, for it is by their agency that truth is practiced and the Buddha's power exhibited. The seed of all Buddhist activity and of all Buddhahood is the true practice of perceptual truth. Not only do you perceive Buddhahood, but you show Buddhahood. For by the keeping and the practicing of perceptual truth, Buddhahood may be seen not only by you in everything around you, but seen in you by everything else around you. When you become Buddha, the whole world becomes Buddha. The whole universe becomes Buddha. When you are not Buddha, then the universe is not Buddha. It is up to you whether society is different or whether it stays the same. People were constantly asking questions about isn't it selfish to do something about you? And as I pointed out on about four different occasions yesterday, if you deal with the individual, the individual being part of society deals with society. Society is a bunch of individuals. If you get the individual right, you get society right. If you get society right, you get government right. If you get government right, you get the universe right. People are all too busy wanting to start on page six, and not one of them wants to start on page one. You have to start at the beginning if you will get something right. You cannot come in in the middle and then say, oh, well, well, I didn't read those early lessons. I don't need them. Yes, you do. Because if you don't go through the whole book, if you do not live life the whole way, there is just no way you are ever going to find out how to do the job properly. All the Buddhas are within the one Buddha, Shakyamuni. This was what I was talking about earlier. And all the Buddhas of past, present, and future become Shakyamuni Buddha when they reach Buddhahood. So you should not think of Shakyamuni Buddha as dead. If you train properly, don't yearn for 2,000 years ago. You yourself can become Shakyamuni Buddha. And he can be sitting here at this meeting within every one of you. And this can be the meeting on Mount Riordan. It can be the meetings in India. You can be listening to him and you can be telling to others. You can be speaking with his voice. It is up to you. For this is how Buddhahood is reached this is what Buddhahood is. It is doing and being a Buddha. It is living from this place where all Buddhahood is. It is being the eye and the treasury of the true law. And every single human body has the eye and the treasury of the true law. If we clean the eyes and we hunt in the treasury. We have to do both. We have to clean our eyes to see clearly 
We have to get them in focus to see clearly. And we then have to have the eagerness to find and search in the treasury. And every one of us owns the whole treasury. We don't own bits of it, we've got the lot. You do not have to yearn for Shakyamuni Buddha. I can remember someone in the Far East being asked uh, something of this sort about, well, wouldn't it be great if Shakyamuni Buddha were here right now? And the young student, one young student, an 18-year-old Japanese, stood up and said, I have nothing to do with the historical Shakyamuni Buddha. And the professor at Komenzawa University was very frightened by this, was very threatened by it, because suddenly he and several of the other people who were examining, this was during an examination, realized that what they were looking at was a young man who had had a cantrel and who knew what Shakyamuni Buddha was. And the physical being that had lived 2,500 years ago didn't matter. What mattered was the undeniable Buddhahood that was, is, and will be. The unborn, the undying, and the uncreated. From which every one of us can personally live. Just imagine what a world would be like if every member of society lived from that place. And also remember something else. This may seem a little facetious, but it's not meant to. There was an old play that used to be put on periodically in England when people complained an awful lot about how evil the world was becoming. Uh, two, a young couple, are not making it very well financially, and they decide that they'll let a room and nobody applies for this room, and the husband is getting desperate. One day he says, if even the devil offer came, I'd, I'd let this room do it. And he's barely said the words when a knock comes on the door, and a Mr. Horn is asking to take the room. And he comes in, and he's carrying his golf clubs and a number of other things, and he's come for a thoroughly good long holiday. And the following day, it's noticed that the police have got nothing to do. Nobody's doing any stealing or killing or robbing and the like. And it's rather worrying because the lawyers, after about a week, have got no work. And nobody's getting sick or dying, so the doctors are all out of work. And the butchers can't sell any meat, and they wouldn't cut it up even if they could. And, I mean, as for judges, I mean, they've gone out of business. And the whole world is at a standstill. Nobody's buying or selling because that would be profiteering on other people. And nobody knows what's going on. And finally, these two suddenly think, well, and Mr. Horn, by the way, he's going out on the golf course every day. He's having a whale of a time. And he is asked one day by one of them who is beginning to cotton on that maybe this is the reason if he is and he said well nobody really truly appreciated me here I am I'm working hard every day of the week I'm doing a terrific job as a really fine devil and no, everybody was talking about me and nobody was appreciating the fact that if it wasn't for me none of you could earn a living a very scary thought. What I'm saying is if you do change society in this way, we will all of us have to start thinking about earning a different type of living. Because the world cannot be as it is now. Now, people say they want society to change. Good. I'm 100% for that. But have they thought what it is they are saying they want? 
I would very much like to get that play and put it on the radio over here. It might do a lot of good because people do not think these things through the whole way. They do not think about them very sensibly. They think about them in a sort of airy-fairy fashion. Just to give one example, that is if everybody genuinely trains themselves. It will be an exquisite place, but it cannot be the world as we know it. So remember, when you want this thing to change, when you want yourself to change, you cannot be the you as you know you. Once that personality change takes place, you can never be as you were. There is no way you can be as you were. And perhaps this is the reason that so many people do not really work all that hard at it. Remember I said the other day that people so often, uh, especially of the Christian and Jewish faith, seem to be singing hymns about how they're longing to go to heaven, and the instant they get a sniffle, they're the first on the doctor's knocker. If they were so anxious to go to heaven, why go to the doctor at all? Just let the sniffle kill them. I mean, they want to go to heaven. Think of what you are saying. Think of what you are doing. When you beckon to enlightenment, when you meditate, you are saying, I want to change. And it's not only going to be just a few things that you're going to change. It's going to be like the man who wants to get to second base on a slippery day. He slides into second base and straight on right past. He is not going to stay in second base. He's going to go the whole way. And if you don't want to go the whole way, if you don't want this absolute, complete and utter change, then don't try doing it. You cannot be as you are. No way you can be as you are. This very mind is itself the Buddha. And should you awaken to complete understanding thereof, your gratitude to the Buddhas will know no bounds. I have dealt with that. Uh, now the sh uh, Shoji. Now Shoji is simply an extension of Shushogi. There are no life and death when the Buddha is within them. When there is no Buddha within life and death, we are not deluded by them. When we are within the Buddha, we can never die and we are not born. Therefore, life and death are simply positions in time, nothing more. There is a date on which the psychophysical thing appeared and a date on which the psychophysical thing disappeared. It is, as I've said, like the electricity and suddenly a bulb breaks and there's no... The electricity is just the same amount that you have to plug in a new bulb. There is a date when you plugged in the new bulb and a date when you took out the old one. That is the meaning of this one. But it's not quite so simple when we get... When there is no Buddha within life and death, we are not deluded by them. Now, this is because of the danger of clinging, clinging to something, longing for something. Oh wow, just think, when I'm dead, all these lovely things are going to happen. The danger of visions is that we look forward to being dead. Wow, if it's like this when I'm dead, just think of how marvelous it's going to be and we start looking forward to being dead. Now the true monk or the true person does not get involved in that side of it. What he does have to do 
is live beyond the opposite of being involved in life and death. After you have found this place, the longing to be there is constant. And that is the next trap you have to get over. After getting over the trap of Bodhisattva or Arahant, what am I training for? You have to get over the next trap, which is, well, I know this place exists, and I'm going to be there when I'm dead, so why don't we speed the process up? You do not need to speed the process up, precisely because you are there right now. So why do you need to speed up a process in time, since there is, in fact, no time? Now I'm going to leave you with that one to sort on for the week for the next few days, along with Uji. All right. Page 242 of uh, the Lotus Blossom. You should read certain words. I, I'm only telling you this because it's important that you um, understand certain words here. The Leng Yang Ching is the Shurangama scripture. The Tathagata or July. Cosmic Buddha or Shakyamuni Buddha, whichever you prefer. The Tao here refer, refers to the Mu or the state of Mu. The Len Ying Chu refers to the Shurangama mantra. I don't know if it's possible nowadays to get hold of a copy of the Shurangama scripture in English. I have got a copy which a friend of mine made a translation, which it's the translation made by a friend of mine. It's a colossal book. I do wish they would get it out in English. One of the big problems of, the, of Buddhism, and Zen in particular, is that everybody is happy and eager and willing, and I think I said to uh, translate and produce books of the anecdotes. And nobody is anxious and willing to produce books of the real teachings, of especially the faith and the uh, spiritual, actual spiritual side of it. They're all interested in the uh, cutesy pie variety and not in the serious religious side of it. The Shurangama is one of these examples. Uh, the divine magic mantra, magic is not the right term, uh, It comes out of a Japanese word which can be translated two ways. The six wisdoms or the six sorceries, depending on how you use them. A lot of Buddhist terminology has words <coughs> that can be used exactly opposite of each other if somebody uses them wrongly. For example, the term Roshi <coughs> can mean, mean noble teacher, old teacher, or useless teacher, or blunt gimlet, whichever you prefer. And when you apply the term to someone, uh, they, all of these things, and all of Buddhist names of monks, monks' names, have double meanings. One of which is very high, very religious, and the other of which is very uh, mundane. And it is so as a person shall strive towards the high whilst knowing that he can be the mundane, that this is done. 
Now, unfortunately, when just scholars translate these works, they frequently pick hold of the wrong one. And here you have the divine magic mantra, which should be the divine wise mantra. I did not want to change the original since we were copying it from someone else, but you should understand that if it is used wrong, then it becomes the evil magic mantra, as opposed to the divine wise mantra. And all Buddhist terminology has this very interesting double meaning all the way, depending what you do with it. Um, I'm going to go into this in detail next time. This is why I'm going through bits and pieces of it right now. Now, next lecture is going to be an extension of this one. And you should go, I, I haven't put this up on the notice board, have I? From page um, 242 to 250 of uh, the Lotus Blossom. OK, let's open it up to questions. I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit more about uh, what you said about being having gratitude for what the senses can reveal to us. And um, here on, on page 162, it says, would you drift as a slave of your senses? Should you, it should be. If you should drift as a slave of your senses. That's a, that's a typo. Well, what, a slave of your yeah, senses. How does that Go with um, to oh, it's very simple. It's very simple. A person is a slave of his senses when he says, I can't possibly eat what you put in front of me. I have to have such and such. When you put the must into your vocabulary, you effectively make yourself a slave of your senses. When you take the must out, you've effectively removed the slavery to the senses. When somebody walks in and says, uh, well, it's such and such for lunch, and you say, oh, wow, or, oh, that's good, or just go and eat it, that's fine. When he said you sit back there and say, no, I'm not going to eat it. I don't want that. Mm. Then you're a slave of your senses, OK? That's just on one thing. I uh, females especially. Uh, as slaves of their senses, or used to be when I was young, for, with regard to clothes and makeup and things like this. And you mean the, they had to have all the reasons. They had to have it the right way and the way they wanted it. Oh, I can't possibly borrow that. That's not me. <laughs> Who the hell is you? <laughs> you see, there are dozens of ways you can do this. Or you can, uh, the best way, of course, is with one's hair. Oh, it's not so obvious nowadays as it was when I was young. But you see, mine, which is growing a bit because I don't want to go around bareheaded at, uh, while I'm down here. I'll take it all off when I get back to Shasta. Mine does fine, so long as I agree with the way in which it wishes to go. It looks terrific. I can't possibly go out. My hair looks awful. <laughs> It must look right or I won't go out. How many times have you heard these things? Meaning, I want it the way I want it, rather than the way it is. And this also comes out in one's daily training as, I won't go to the cosmic Buddha unless he does it the way I want it, and unless he teaches me what I want to hear. And the cosmic Buddha says, no, get it to get to me what you have to do is keep the precepts, and you have to keep them absolutely. If you want to be the same as me, then you have to do what I do. And you can't have it on your terms. Having things on your terms is to be a slave of the senses. Then is, is in Zen Buddhism, do they believe that one should renounce sensual desires? One doesn't need to renounce them. One can get beyond them. 
You don't have to renounce them. They just don't have to make a slave of you. You see, as it says in Shorji, in the beginning, no, it's not in Shorji, it's in here. What am I talking about? I periodically forget where my information is. Um, hmm, where's that thing? Not yet having arrived at the other shore, he cannot do without things. On arriving at the other shore, things can be used again. In other words, before you make it, you have to have everything. You must have everything. When you've made it, you just use things and enjoy using them. But if you don't get them, it doesn't matter. Is that like being not being attached? It being, not being thing? attached to them, yes. Mm -hmm. they take it or leave it. Too. Yes, and as one of the worst examples in present day, in present day, of course, is someone who says, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I'm getting older. Men won't be interested in me. I'll have no point to life. But there's a lot of point to life. You see what I mean? It doesn't matter. You, you can have it, and it's terrific fun. Not having arrived at the other shore, you have to have everything. When you get there, you can use everything. But it doesn't, but everything does not use you. When I own this book, and this book does not own me, then I am not a slave of my intellect. <coughs> when I own my lunch, and the lunch does not look at me and say, I own you, then I am satisfied inside. Does that give you a clear picture of it? Okay. Good. Right, you had something. Yes? Uh, we talked about not being able to, uh, we know when we're not meditating and uh, not necessarily know when we are meditating. Uh, what about looking back? Can we, can we tell what we did? That was an enlightened act or that was an unenlightened act? The only way you can, you know, this is the reason that newspapers only ever print bad news. Have you ever seen that good news doesn't get into the newspaper? But bad news always does. You always hear about unenlightened actions. And unfortunately, it gets to the state when that is our entertainment as well. There was a really pornographic movie on a horror called Black Sunday uh, two or three nights ago. I wanted to watch something because I was feeling very tired and I flicked the thing. I looked, oh my God. Just slammed the set off because there wasn't anything else. We get to the state when we think that because unenlightened action is the only thing we ever seem to read about, then unenlightened action is the only thing that is entertaining. But that's because most of us do not know what enlightened action is. Now once you have had a Kensho, there is something else that opens up. And that is a whole new version of entertainment, if you like. A whole new way of living. You remember I told you earlier that if you do make it to this place, if everybody in this room makes it to this place, there isn't one of you that will probably be able to keep his or her old job. You'll all be in the market for new ones. Because you see, everything is then going to change. It means that the average person who has had a Kensho is an extraordinarily lonely person. It is also why they all tend to get together in monasteries. Because then there is a totally different set of entertainments, a totally different set of uh, amusements, a totally different way to live. Does that answer your question? Not really. Oh, sorry. 
Uh, try it again. Maybe I, I answered the wrong angle of it. Yeah. So despairing or whatever. Mm -hmm. But in looking back in hindsight, is, is it possible to? I, I, it is possible, isn't it, to see what we did correctly? Oh, very definitely so. Yes, and also you get all the bonuses. You get all the bonuses that come from doing both right action and right meditation. And they, of themselves, make it worthwhile. But that's not the reason for which you do it. Yes, I'm sorry, I just went off uh, following my own train of thought. My apologies. Go ahead. Can, can one have enlightened action in bits and pieces? I mean, for instance, I have various and sundry traits which I'm trying to overcome. Yeah. Okay. And, for instance, if I overcame one, Mm -hmm. Would that be, um, be a, okay? Not being attached to things is, mm -hmm. is the precept that I'm trying to work with. Yes. All right. Now, can you be enlightened if you get unattached to one thing at a time? I mean, interestingly enough, it's like splitting an atom. If you get unattached to one thing, it's extraordinarily simple to get unattached to the rest. It's always the first one that's rough. Now, people have often said that the Chinese were insincere because uh, they could take just one precept of Jukai. When you take, uh, when you take Jukai in, in the Far East, you're asked how many precepts you want to take. And supposing a prostitute turns up, as has happened, and says, well, I badly want to take Jukai, but my job is being a prostitute, so how can I take the one against uh, sexual, uh, doing sexual um, acts? And the monk will say, that's fine, you take all the rest. Now, a, bon a merchant will turn up and says, well, I can take most of them, but I can't take the one against stealing. What should I do? That's all right, you just take all the rest. Now, you see, if you're really sincerely trying to do something, you get one right, and somehow all the others automatically go right anyway, and you get knocked out of the one you didn't want to do. Anyway, so, so the Chinese are quite willing and happy for you to do it, thinking you're doing it piecemeal, because, in fact, you're doing it the whole way. For example, supposing a person kills someone, for a start, he steals the person's life. He covets his life. He defames him because he thinks nothing of him. He defames the cosmic Buddha because he is looking, he is thinking that this person does not matter. He has already killed. But supposing he saves that life, he doesn't steal it, he doesn't covet it. And you see what I mean? In keeping one, you keep the whole lot. So it's fine if you don't want to, if you don't want to do one. That's fine. You keep all the rest. But that's not precisely what I'm saying. Is, is within not being attached to things. Yes. I am say attached to the idea of having a house and uh, attached to my children and yeah. attached. Okay. And if I get unattached to say the idea of the house, and but. Still You'll find if you get unattached to the house, then you'll get a lot less attached to your children and a lot less attached to everything else. Once you loosen the hold of one thing, you loosen the hold of the whole lot. It's like one big knot. Haven't you ever seen when you've had a huge knot on a, on a parcel and if you've managed to get that first bit off, you can get the rest undone? In actual fact, it isn't. It does loosen. But, uh, besides, nothing succeeds like success. <laughs> you get one done, and automatically the others start being a lot simpler. 
Haven't you ever found out with people that uh, if they don't have any success at all, they seem to feel they can never have any success? And then one day something happens, and by golly, they go the whole way. I can give you an example of myself as a very young, very young person. The school I was at didn't think I'd make much use of myself, and then I went into the Royal Naval Reserve. This was uh, many, many years ago. And the psychologist, or shrink, or whatever he was, gave us all tests. And uh, I came out with a very high IQ, and I said, that's not possible. And I said, you, you better, better redo me. I, I mean, this just isn't possible. He said, did somebody tell you you were no good? I said, yeah. He said, hmm. Well, let me prove you wrong. And he did. And I've gone like a bomb ever since. <laughs> Nothing succeeds like success. If somebody always tells you you're lousy, then you're always going to be lousy. Suddenly somebody comes along and says, uh-uh. Somebody loosens one of the knots and you undo the whole collection. Run it. You're running a razor's edge the whole way. You had something. Yeah, do you, does one have enlightened uh, moments of action without having had a pencil? Yes. I, I'd like to describe them, but I'm sleepy. I yes. They're known as the little moments that make one dance. Yeah. I, had, I had certain skills as a teacher, right? And occasionally, I would realize I was going to be able to solve a problem in the classroom. And I'll experience this of not being the one who does it like it's coming to me. Like, like yes. I'm yes. in a sort of grateful, I'm feeling grateful. Encourage that. Students. Encourage that. Encourage it with all your might. Well, I think it's probably one of the nicest experiences of my life. Yes. Why? I feel like I'm leaving it. Because, you feeling. see, when you do enlightened action, when you actually have a cantrel, you become a pipe, as it were, mm -hmm. that is no longer bunged up through which the spirit, the water of the Lord, can flow. And when you do not do it, when it does it, when you are out of the way, then it is showing itself in you. But don't try to make it happen because you can't make it happen by skill. But you can look back at it. You can look back at it and love it. But the component of it that's so interesting to me is that... Don't get attached to it. The component of it that's so interesting to me is that it's not... You don't take any pride in the moment. Right. That's the point at issue. That's the point at issue. One person had a big kensho in Chester and came to see me three or four years later and said, by the way, I've just read something. It's a bit like something that happened to me a few years ago. I didn't tell anybody about it because, well, there didn't seem much point to it. It was rather enjoyable. And he didn't know anything at all about what happened. And I tested and checked and it came out absolutely correct. And he had gone along with it exactly as he should. It had been very enjoyable, right? Let's go on from here. Yes. And there was no pride in it. Right, but there's a term among psychologists called the peak experience, which I know you'd like to, to equate that with yes. religion with moral psychology, and that they define that very much like As the peak experience. Hmm. That's interesting. Except that, uh, is psychology talking of it as one of the specific little moments, or is it talking of it as a sustained condition? Because once you have, once you have a full-scale kensho, it's a sustained condition. Right, no, they're not talking about it as a sustained condition. And that's why it's so exquisite, and why um, meditation, uh, just from a very practical and uh, uh, mundane point of view, is so incredibly valuable because you do not need drugs or anything else to hype you up and make you stay in this lovely state. Yes? I had the impression that the, the Kensho wasn't a sustained thing, that it lasted maybe for some days, but that it... The that it what, what it gives you lasts forever. What, it, what you get stays forever. The actual uh, tremendous excitement and joy, excitement's the wrong word, joy and... Uh, Oh, ecstasy goes, fades with time. 
but it leaves something behind. And that you never lose. It leaves behind it a certainty, but it leaves more than that. It leaves a lot of very beautiful things behind. Complete with a complete change of personality. A lot of people will lose their jobs in here. Who have had the first potential make of life. Yeah, I'm not... Th- uh, but you can never be as if you haven't had it. You see, a man who's seen a ghost can never be as a man who hasn't seen a ghost. He'll have always seen a ghost. Even if he gets a little less scared, he'll have still seen a ghost. Yes, you can go wrong. But you see, in a way, the first one is look at what the possibilities are if you get all these things right. And then you can decide, well, yes, I'll get it right. Why, why not get it all right? And then gradually, oh, it's such a fag, it's such a fag, Mara gets in the way, and you stop getting it right. Now, at any time, you can pick it up again and turn it round and go on. And one day, especially if you have a near go on you in your car, some twit very nearly bashes into you or something of the sort, surprising what can get a sort of, uh, what's the word, a stalled first Kensho into activity. There's nothing like a near car accident or a Skylab falling to get stalled <laughs> Kenshos going. It's quite remarkable how much self can be made use of for positive action. <laughs> you said that people who have had the first potentials or any kind of enlightenment would earn their living in a different way. Yeah. Did I understand you correctly? Yes. How, what would they do then? What kind of... You never, right know, you never quite know. Yeah. And they might actually do something that is not terribly much a right livelihood if the cancer has gone wrong, too. Um, that's another risk, but not after a third one. That will never take place after a third. But it can after a first if somebody has gone slightly wrong with it. And then when they turn around, they'll change it again. There are risks all the way. You just have to keep on watching all the time. Once you've had a third one, it's a lot easier. A lot easier. <laughs> yes? For me, what decides um, any um, priest to go to a certain uh, city to set a temple? Is there, is you, what, in our school, you mean? If there is an interest in that city, you see, we have a lot of correspondence members. We are a peculiar organization in that we started as a foreign guest department in Sorgiji, which meant that the, pe- the majority of the people who were our original congregation were members of the uh, armed forces, armed services, stationed in Japan. Now, they were from all over this country. When they went back to their various cities and towns, they continued to sit and friends would sit with them, things like this, or people would hear about us by various means, or people would move and they would want to keep in contact with us. And they would get friends or just have friends who'd drop in and sit with them. And gradually, small meditation groups sort of got formed in some of the most incredibly outlandish places. And what we have tried to do is when there are four or five such groups within a reasonable distance, we say a reasonable distance is 100 miles of a central point, then we try to get a priory in the center so that those five groups can be serviced five different days a week, you see, like a parish priest who goes around the five. And so the nucleus develops in the middle. And it's when there are enough groups to create an interest that someone is sent.
What I'm effectively doing is trying to get over four main points. One, Buddhists are not atheists. Two, they don't break the law. Three, if you don't do something about cleaning your life up and keeping precepts, you will never be a Buddhist. Um, and four, what you have to do, how you meditate, and that meditation and prayer are identically the same. And I keep hammering these four points. If the attitude of the person who taught me mathematics, in the sense that if you keep throwing mud, some will eventually stick. <laughs> this is eventually sticking. I mean, it's the other way to get it through a few skulls. Yes. They were both trying very, very hard not to say too much of what was going on. There's one lovely little piece in St. Teresa of Avila where she is feeling the flying take place that I describe in the Lotus Blossom. And she gets the nuns to hang on to her like mad because she's terrified somebody in the congregation in the church might see that she's changed somewhat and she does not want to land up in the arms of the Inquisition. I mean, she bluntly says so. And that all the way through, they are worried, quite obviously, that these things are going to happen. And these two are great friends and they're talking about the same thing with each other. And sort of almost doing it... Uh, I was going to say in a closet, whispering to each other, because they're terrified of what could happen. Now, you also have to remember that both of them were very severely persecuted because they deliberately changed their lifestyle. When this happened to them, it changed them to such an extent it caused them to deliberately change their lifestyle. And they became much, much humbler, much more humble human beings, much more awed by the glory of God and the wonders of God. But they still had to show themselves to a certain extent in the same way as other monks and nuns or they would have been burned at the stake. So yes, they do deliberately try to push the ego to a certain extent. They're trying to save themselves by bending over backwards to do what the authorities want whilst at the same time not lying. And they do some remarkable feats to do that. And when you consider that St. John was flogged every night during the length of a psalm, whilst the rest of the monks ate for six months and was nearly killed for it because they said he was too humble. And finally he was rescued from the monastery. He was, uh, well, what they were really saying was he was the real thing and they didn't know what they wanted to go that far. He became what was called a discalced Carmelite. He decided that he was going to go around with no shoes on because when he found what God really was, when he found this incredible love, he realized how infinitesimally small and unimportant he was. And that is what everybody realizes when they have a big third potential. My God, how, I am absolutely nothing. I am a worm and no man, as the psalm says. And that is, what, that is how you get rid of self. You realize that you matter nothing. It's not a matter of taking hold of your ego and tearing it up. And um, That's not what it's talking about. It's recognizing the size of you in the scheme of things recognizing what you really are in that scheme of things, which is genuine humility. As Eckhart puts it, to want nothing, have nothing, and know nothing. This is true humility. But you're nothing and everything at the same time, aren't you? Because it's the fullest the everything, <laughs> yes. You're the universe, too, and nothing. But you don't own the universe. No, no, but I mean... You are it. Yeah. That's a difference. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, go ahead. How did your personality change when you had your first Kensho? When I had the first one, I suddenly realized that instead of being such a marvelous monk as I thought I was, I was the worst in existence. 
and we had to start all the way from scratch, read all the books over again, and they all made totally different sense from what they did before. Absolutely, totally different. And I wanted to get, grab hold of everything that I'd ever written and tear it up because I was in such a mess to write it. And one day I realized that that was impossible since half of it was in print. Um, not that sense. And then I made a few mistakes again and I had to pay for them later on. Yes, you realize, you begin to realize your true position in the scheme of things, and that the world does not evolve around you. Yeah, go ahead. That's such a very delicate point of feeding into inadequacy. I mean, yeah. just with, I believe... Ah, but you don't become inadequate with it. Yeah, but I'm saying, you know, when the word's unimportant, I mean, and it, it can feed into other thoughts, I mean, it's always been that way, you know? It's a real <laughs> point, and I understand that, but it's, um, it's a very fine line. It's just a very fine line. Well, when you get it, you've found so much more that you don't count. You know the bit in the Bible about the pearl of great price, and you sell everything that you have in order to buy it? You just chuck everything you have because you've now found this. But you don't have it, you just share it. And that's as it should be, because the one thing you want to do is give this to every other living person. Because who would want to live the other way when they could live this one? And the real tragedy is that half of them don't want it. You're still thinking, I can see. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I don't have another question. Yes. There's a Zen center up in Marin on the way to the ocean. How is that different from, I take it that's not affiliated? It's not affiliated, but it's the same school. We both come under the same bishop. It's not affiliated in the sense that there are probably a couple of Baptist churches in this town, and they're both totally different churches, and they're run by totally different people, but they're both Baptists. But it is the, the same school. I, I, it's the same school of Zen, yes. So does Zen, yes. I don't know what they do. I don't know how they do it. I would imagine they do it the same way we do, but I just don't know. I had an arrangement to go and see the priest who was there. This was ten years ago. And he was always where I wasn't whenever we tried to see each other. And he died eventually, and I don't know the person <laughs> So, I would imagine it's fine, I just don't know the answer. Go you ahead. You say that most people, or half the people, don't want, want this. How can, one, uh, how, do, how can one create the desire to want it? Or can one? The well, tragedy is that most people don't want it. They go seeking other things until it's almost too late to get it. Too many people only want it when they get very close to death or um, when some terrible tragedy strikes. This, in one sense, is the difference between the monk and the layman. The monk says, I want it now. I'm not going to wait until some tragedy strikes. I'm going to start working for it right now. And the layman frequently has to have something that really kicks him into activity. 